Uh, my name is Jocelyn Downey, and I'm a professor here in the Schulich School of Law. And uh, I want to first of all thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's uh, nothing like death to bring out a crowd. Uh, I'm, I'm actually really grateful for the opportunity to talk with you tonight um, about medical assistance in dying. And I'm going to call it MAID for the rest of tonight. Two quick caveats for you. Um, I won't be talking about the specifics of Quebec. It's a little different than the rest. Happy to go into it in the discussion period if you have any questions, but I won't be covering it specifically in my remarks. And the second is, I have to say, this is up to date as of January 23rd, 2019. Could be different tomorrow. Things just keep happening in the field of MAID. So this is my best effort to get together everything we know about what's going on as of today. So let's talk about MAID in Canada. Um, where we are and where we may go from here in the future. So first off, uh, where are we? Well, we're in the company of a growing number of countries and states in which MAID is legal. It's worth pausing for just a moment to contemplate how momentous that statement is. MAID is legal in Canada. Okay, now with that, we're going to drill down into uh, what that actually means in Canada. Specifically, what are the nuts and bolts uh, of the Canadian MAID legislation? And what I'm, I'm, I'm going to call that C14 from now on, because that's the name as it was introduced in the federal parliament. So we sort of came to know it as that, and it's shorter than the whole long name of the legislation. So that's what C14 is. It's our federal legislation. So first, of course, we have to ask, what is MAID? So it is two things in Canada. It is the administering by a medical practitioner or nurse practitioner of a substance to a person at their request that causes their death. In the past, we would have called that euthanasia. It is also the prescribing or providing by a medical practitioner or nurse practitioner of a substance to a person at their request so that they may self-administer and in so doing cause their own death. We used to call that assisted suicide, and in some places it's still called that. But in Canada, we talk about both these things. This, this is what MAID is. Um, who can access MAID? There's a set of eligibility criteria in the legislation. You have to be eligible for health services funded by the government in Canada, a government in Canada, or you would be but for the minimum period. So sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's six months. Bottom line there is we won't have what's known as you know, MAID tourism. People can't just pick up and come to Canada to get MAID. You have to be at least 18 years old capable of making decisions with respect to their health, have made a voluntary request, and have given informed consent to receive MAID after having been informed of the means of alleviating their suffering, including palliative care. And that language is right in the legislation. Also, you have to have what's called a grievous and irremediable medical condition. And this phrase is then defined in the legislation as follows have to have a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability, be in an advanced state of irreversible decline and capability. The illness, disease, or disability, or that state of decline, has to cause enduring physical or psychological suffering that is intolerable to the person and cannot be relieved by any means that they consider to be acceptable, subjective. And, here's the kicker, their natural death has become reasonably foreseeable, taking into account all of their medical circumstances without a prognosis necessarily having been made as to the specific length of time that they have remaining. There are also some procedural safeguards. So for example, two providers have to confirm that all of those eligibility criteria have been met. 10 clear days have to elapse between the day the request is signed and the day made is provided. And there's an exception there, which is if loss of capacity or death is imminent, you can shorten that 10-day waiting period. And you have to have reconfirmation of consent immediately before the provision of MAID. Now, it's worth noting here, before we um, leave this overview of the legislation, a few things. So, both practitioner and self-administer. Medical and nurse practitioners. So, physicians and nurse practitioners can provide MAID. You do not have to be terminally ill. You do not have to be at the end of life. The intolerability of suffering is subjective. It's up to the person who is experiencing the suffering, 
and we have no requirement of prior judicial review. You don't need to go to court and get an order to say, yes, that's okay, you can proceed with MAID. So some of these things are what set us apart a bit from other jurisdictions that don't have all of these uh, variables. So turning from the nuts and bolts of um, where we are, let's look at where we are by the numbers. We know MAID can happen under the legislation. The question is then, is it happening? Easy answer is yes, indeed it is. So by the latest data, official data, between December 10, 2015 and December 31, 2017, there were 3,714 cases of MAID. And we know that that means many, many, many more people were helped, they were comforted, uh, because they knew MAID would be available even if they didn't ultimately choose to access it. So let's drill down a little bit more on these numbers. Um, you can have provider or self-administration, as I said before, but notice it's almost entirely physician. <coughs> physician, nurse practitioner, sorry, I, I blurred those two. So it's almost entirely clinician administered, not self-administered. And we can go into the reasons for that. You also can have a doctor or a nurse practitioner, but again, we see that it's almost entirely physicians. And again, we can go into the reasons for that. It's about evenly split between home and hospital as far as where it happens. There's a smattering of other places um, on the books. It's happening more in large urban centers, but not by a huge margin uh, than in the smaller centers. It's significant, but not, I'd say, massive. The average age of the person accessing MAID is 73. And the split between men and women is almost even. At the moment, 51%, 49%. The most common underlying medical conditions, cancer-related by far, so 64% are cancer-related. Then you also have circulatory respiratory system issues, you'll have neurodegenerative conditions, and then you have the mysterious other, which hopefully as we get better data, uh, that number will drop because we'll actually know what they, what they are. So that's who's getting made. What about those who request made but don't get it? 18.4% died before completion of the assessment process. And that's a significant number. The most frequent reasons for being found to be ineligible are loss of competency, death is not reasonably foreseeable, and other. A quick note on Nova Scotia data. Um, there have been, in the, in the last window that they reported on, which is January 1 to June 30th, 2018, 94 referrals to the MAID service. 40% of those were completed. So 60% of people who didn't complete the procedure either withdrew their request, lost capacity, or died before receiving MAID, or they were in the process while this report was generated. The average age of those who did receive MAID was 70, slightly more male than female, and again, cancer, the most commonly reported diagnosis, followed by neurodegenerative cardiovascular and respiratory. So a few reflections on the numbers. There really aren't any surprises in the demographics, you know, age, gender, that kind of thing. Um, there are no indications of people getting access who aren't eligible. There are some indications of barriers to access, I would say. I have a concern about timely access to assessments and provision. Concern about self-administration. Why is it point, what was it, point zero one, something like that? Uh, concern about the low, low, low numbers of nurse practitioners, in part because that's actually an, an access issue, particularly in underserviced communities. And a concern about the low numbers that we're seeing in hospice. Those are reflected in the data. They're hinted at in the data, I would say. Um, we will, we should have better data coming because we now have a federal oversight system. It came into effect November 1st, and hopefully we'll have a much better sense of what's going on uh, in the future. So that's where we are. Now the harder part, where do we go from here? And there are five issues that I want to talk about um, before we get into the discussion period. Charter challenges, some confusion about the meaning of the legislation, um, religion and conscience issues, there's some outstanding federal issues, and I would say some outstanding provincial issues in Nova Scotia. So first, the charter challenges. And there are two cases to talk about here. First, I have to take you on a bit of a trip down memory lane 
um, because understanding what came before is essential to understanding what's going to come next with respect to the charter challenges. So I have to take you back to the Carter case. Um, Kay Carter was 89 years old. She had spinal stenosis. She was in incredible pain and severely debilitated. Uh, her family took her to Switzerland for an assisted suicide. And when they came back, they launched what became known as the Carter case. They challenged the criminal code prohibition on MAID. They said it violated the charter. And then Gloria Taylor, who you see on the other side of the slide, joined the case. She was a woman with ALS, a neurodegenerative condition. Um, she was also arguing that the prohibition that we had in the criminal code on MAID um, violated her charter rights. So we had the trial, started in 2011, and the decision came out in June 2012. And Justice Lynn Smith, who you see here, found that the charter was violated by the criminal code prohibitions on MAID. The case then worked its way up through the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the unanimous court, 9 nothing, with the decision signed by the court, which is what they do when they want to send a really, really strong message that they are really, really unanimous, um, it, they, they agreed. And they found that the criminal code prohibitions were void insofar as they prohibit physician-assisted death, for a competent adult person who clearly consents to the termination of life, has a grievous and irremediable medical condition, including an illness, disease, or disability that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the circumstances of his or her condition. And irremediable, they added in the decision, does not require the patient to undertake treatments that are not acceptable to the individual. So the Supreme Court of Canada had spoken. They gave a year to the then conservative government to put in place legislation if they wanted to before the, um, the voiding of the legislation would actually take effect. Um, the conservative government dragged its feet. Then there was an election, and they lost the election. So then the liberal government came in. They inherited the deadline of February in the fall. They asked for an extension. They asked for a long extension. They got a short one. So in the end, they had until June to deal with the situation. So Bill C-14 was introduced in April, and there was an absolute firestorm in Parliament, in part because it did not closely enough map onto uh, the Carter decision. That was the heart of the, the criticism of it. So an act to amend the criminal code to make rela related amendments to other acts made legislation comes into force in June. Key to note, is that the C-14 eligibility, saying it has to be incurable, you have to be in an advanced state of decline and capability, and your natural death has to have become reasonably foreseeable, nowhere to be found in Carter. So 10 days later, if you were watching the pictures, book, the legal team from Carter launched an action. They, made, they launched a charter challenge to the new legislation in the name of Julia Lamb, who's a young woman who suffers from a degenerative neurological condition. Some months later, uh, Jean-Pierre Renard on the other side launched Truchon Gladue Challenge in Quebec. You'll have seen that in the news very recently, um, just because of rules of courts. It's in court well before actually Lamb will get to court, even though Lamb was actually initiated long before Truchon Gladue. But effectively, both are saying uh, that, this, that the circle of who may have access under C-14 is smaller than the circle of those who must have access under the charter. So the plaintiff's legal team is arguing, look, C-14 violates Section 7, which is the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, because people will end their lives sooner than they otherwise would because of this. They'll, they'll um, commit suicide while they still can. Um, that it's liberty, security of the person is violated because a very profound personal decision is being taken away from people. Um, that there's a violation of Section 15, the equality provisions, because persons with disability are discriminated against, and the, the perpetuation of prejudice or stereotyping has largely to do with the notion that people with disabilities somehow have less capacity for decision-making than people without disabilities, because that's the effect of C-14. Also arguing that it doesn't minimally impair, which is the test, minimally impair those 7 and 15 rights, the argument being that you could achieve the same goals for the legislation. Um, I'm just hearing an echo. Is that me? Or is other people hearing? Yeah. Is there anything we can do? 
No. Let me just, there is a volume button on here, so let me just try to, it would be better to not be, oh no, it's over here. Does that change it? Reduces my volume, but can people still hear? Okay, let's, let's go with that. So it doesn't minimally impair the rights because you could actually achieve the legitimate goals of legislation without restricting access to people like Julia Lamb, uh, Nicole Gladieu, and Jean Truchon. People basically with disabilities that are not going to get them close enough to death, either temporally or in terms of the predictability of their cause of death, to qualify under the reasonably foreseeable provision, basically. The government response has been to say, and this is the now former Minister of Justice, very recently former Minister of Justice, Jody Wilson-Raybould, she said, we're confident in the legislation that we brought forward, that it finds the right balance in terms of being able to access medical assistance in dying, protecting the autonomy of individuals to make the appropriate decisions for themselves, as well as protecting vulnerable individuals. They go on to say, and they're arguing in court, that what they've done is achieve the right balance between protecting autonomy and preventing suffering, and on the other side, preventing errors and abuse in the provision of MAID, to affirm the inherent and equal value of every person's life, and to avoid encouraging negative perceptions of the quality of life of persons who are elderly, ill, or disabled, to protect vulnerable persons from being induced in moments of weakness to end their lives, and because they say suicide is a significant public health issue that can have lasting and harmful effects on individuals, families, and communities. So they argue that that is the right balance. The bottom line here is that competent individuals who are experiencing enduring, intolerable, and irremediable suffering as a result of a grievous and irremediable medical condition are prevented by C14 from accessing MAID, basically if they have disability or a degenerative condition um, with years until death or without a predictable cause of death. The path is not clear. And it has to be said they're not too old. Because we pointed out when they brought out the legislation that Kay Carter wouldn't have qualified because her death was not, she wasn't, she could have lived for six, ten years and there wasn't a predictable cause of death. And, and the minister said, oh, but she was really old. <laughs> Suddenly that became a criteria. That's troubling. Anyway, tangent, back from the tangent. So their choices are, people who are in that circumstance, the circumstance of Julia Lamb and Nicole Gladieu and Jean Truchon, their choices are you continue to live with suffering. Or, for instance, you refuse turning. If you refuse turning, you will get bed sores. They will get infected. You refuse the antibiotics for that, and you will die. Or they refuse food and liquids and die of starvation or dehydration. Or if they have the resources and are mobile enough, they go to Switzerland for assisted suicide. And the question is, does this violate the charter? Where do we go from here with that question? Well. We have the charter challenges, and the court may strike down the narrow definition um, that the legislation gives us for grievous and irremediable medical condition. Maybe Parliament will amend the legislation to fix it. Maybe there will be a reference to the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court of Canada. That is where somebody, like it's, it's the government, says to a court, please give us an answer on whether this is constitutional or not, and doesn't put the burden of litigating that question on people like Nicole Gladieu and Jean Truchon. And actually just this week, the Quebec professional regulators, seven of them, the physicians, the nurses, the pharmacists, the social workers, the lawyers, and the notaries, they all sent a message to the government of Quebec and said, please send a reference to the Court of Appeal to test the constitutionality of this. Now we also, we have a new Minister of Justice, federal aid, new Attorney General, Minister of Justice, just came in, and I would note here that at the time of C-14 going through Parliament, he actually voted against rejecting the amendments that would have taken out the narrow definitions because he said this law as drafted as the government wanted it is at serious risk of being found to be unconstitutional. Interesting place to be, Minister of Justice now, being asked to take reference on something that he thinks serious risk of being found unconstitutional. Awkward spot to be in. But, you know, it opens up the possibility that maybe a reference 
uh, will go. Who knows? Stay tuned. Come back next year, and uh, and we'll tell you. Okay, so on to the on to the second issue: the, the confusion about C14. So we have to ask: you know, there's confusion about what some of the words and phrases in the legislation actually mean. And there's some confusion about what's actually legal under the legislation. So there's a set of words and phrases in the legislation that when I was reading them out may have had you scratching your head. And indeed, when I first read the legislation and many others read it, we scratched our heads because like, what does that mean? Um, natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. Does that mean, I mean, all of our, I hate to break it to you, all of that's reasonably foreseeable. Um, but it can't mean that, right? So what does it mean? And so people initially thought it meant, OK, you have to be a certain proximity to death. But it can't mean that. Actually, if you get in and do the statutory interpretation, I don't think it can mean that. It may mean a predictable path to death. So for instance, the Minister of Health actually said at the time, on diagnosis with ALS, somebody would meet that criteria. They wouldn't meet all the criteria, because it wouldn't be advanced enough, but they'd meet reasonably foreseeable. So the question is, what does it mean? Does it mean temporal proximity, close enough? Or is, is that just sufficient? So if you're close enough, that's OK. But also, but you don't have to be close enough. If you're, if you're on a predictable course to death, that's also OK. We don't know. Uh, incurable. Does that mean by any means or only by means acceptable to the patient? Irreversible declining capability. Does that mean physical capability only or also mental capability? Imminent loss of capacity to provide informed consent. Remember, that's the exception to the 10-day waiting period. Does that mean naturally imminent? Or could it be imminent due to the provision of medication necessary to control suffering? So these are uncertain. I have opinions about what all these things mean. But that's not you know, a lot of comfort for a doctor or nurse practitioner who's thinking, yeah, but if you're wrong, I'm going to jail. So we have, we, we have a serious problem. Criminal liabilities at stake. Law needs to be clear. There's also confusion about what's actually legal. Here are some examples. V said as a path to maid. So voluntary stopping eating and drinking as a path to maid. So say I'm told that I don't qualify because I have a disability, but my natural death is not reasonably foreseeable. So I'm, I'm like a Nicole Truchon, or a, a Nicole Glaiteur or Jean Truchon. Can I say, OK, I'm stopping eating and drinking. Now my natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. So now I qualify for maid. We don't know. Um, rescue provider administration after failed self-administration. OK, so if I decide I want to go down the path of self-administering instead of having um, needles and an and, and injection from a physician, if the physician's there and it doesn't work, so I don't die, but I'm comatose, can they give me an injection? Which they could have done if they'd done it at the beginning, right? if I hadn't self-administered. I could have consented to it, but right now I'm not competent. So immediately prior to the provision of the injection, I'm not competent. So is that a violation of the criminal law? There's some suggestion from the government that that's actually a violation of the criminal law. There is a strong pushback from the providers that that's abandonment. And they can't, you can't force providers to sit there while this just goes completely sideways. Question about physician nurse practitioner raising the issue of made with a patient versus responding to questions and requests. Some people have suggested that, yeah, for sure you answer all questions, but what, what if somebody doesn't ask you about it? Can you, must you, raise the issue? Some people say, oh, that might be aiding and abetting suicide. I would argue you have a duty to inform. If it is an option for the person, you have a duty to inform. But again, it's an, it's an open question. So the path ahead here is also uncertain. The courts may interpret uh, the legislation, as they did in a case called AB in Ontario, where they interpreted reasonably foreseeable and said, it is not temporal proximity. It's not how close you are to death. It's about that and predictable pathway. So they opened it, they opened it up for Ontario. Um, we may see criminal charges. Maybe somebody gets it wrong, and they get charged. Or they got it right, but they still get charged. And then we get that figured out. Uh, we may see regulatory colleges. So here, kudos to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Nova Scotia, who put into their MAID standard an interpretation of reasonably foreseeable, which has made it very clear it's not terminal illness. It's not one year. 
it's about a predictable path to death four times. Or we may have the other side, which is there's a, there are multiple um, complaints in BC um, about providers that they breached the law. One of them, for instance, was about VSET as a path to MAID. And they found, so a complaint was made about a doctor who gave MAID after a person had not qualified, but then stopped eating and drinking, and then she said, okay, you can have MAID. Complaint was made, the college said, no, that's not, that's not professional misconduct, that's not that. So we start to get some hints about what the answers to these questions are. Much better possibilities, from my perspective, are that we get amendments to the federal legislation, put definitions in the act. Makes it very clear for everybody. Or we get federal or prosecutorial charting guidelines. So you could have the prosecution service here in Nova Scotia, which is independent, say, um, we will not be prosecuting. We don't see it as being in the public interest to prosecute in certain circumstances. This is what these words mean to us. This is how we interpret the criminal law. And that could give some comfort and guidance to people. We could see a federal glossary. They produced one when they introduced the legislation. So there's really no good reason for them not producing one now, but they, they backed it off their website. Um, so again, stay tuned, watch this space, come back next year. Okay, issue three, religion and conscience. And this deals with both providers and institutions. So the providers first. Um, these are doctors and nurse practitioners who have a religious or conscientious objection to participating in MAID. It's important to note that the Supreme Court of Canada did touch on Carter, but did conscience in Carter, but didn't give us good answers because basically they, they, they said, we do not wish to preempt the legislative and regulatory response. Rather, we underline that the charter rights of patients and physicians will need to be reconciled. Right? So it's not answered in the decision, despite what you might hear from some sources. C14 as well did not answer this question. It said, nothing in the act affects the charter guarantee of freedom of conscience and religion. Nothing in the act compels an individual to provide or assist in providing. Nothing stops people from providing. It just doesn't, it doesn't address it. So that takes us to a case that's in the news this week as well. And, and that is the Christian Medical and Dental Society of Canada and College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. The appeal was heard um, just earlier this week, as I said. So what happened is the college in Ontario, the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Ontario, put in their MAID policy that doctors have a duty of effective referral. If you object, fine, you don't have to provide, you don't have to assess, but you have a duty of effective referral. And the Christian medical doc doctors and dentists took them to court and said that this policy violated their charter rights, their Section 2A freedom of conscience, freedom of religion rights. And the court found in a very, very strongly worded decision, I encourage you to have a look at it, um, that yes, the policy limits freedom of religion. No, it doesn't discriminate. It's not a violation of equality because it doesn't arise from any demeaning stereotype, um, but rather from a neutral and rationally defensible policy course. And they said that the breach of Section 2A um, is justified because they said the goal of ensuring access to healthcare, in particular, particular equitable access to healthcare, is pressing and substantial, and that the requirements impair the individual applicant's rights of religious freedom as little as reasonably possible, it's the test, in order to achieve the goal. And they went on to say alternatives proposed by the applicants, so that doctors and dentists would compromise the goal of ensuring access to healthcare in many situations, often involving vulnerable members of society. Important to see here that they're seeing people who want access to MAID as vulnerable. It's often people who, when, when the government's talking about vulnerable people, that's not who they're talking about. But that's what they're recognizing here. And they said the requirements of the college were proportionate in terms of the effects. The positive effects associated with the effective referral requirements of the policies are significant. The impact on the individual applicants, while not trivial, does not extend to deprivation of the ability to practice medicine in Ontario although it may require an accommodation on their part. So we wait for the decision from the Court of Appeal. You might be wondering what's going on in other provinces and territories. There's a range of positions that have been taken by regulatory bodies. Uh, one, the effective transfer of care, rather than referral, transfer of care. It's bolded because that's Nova Scotia's standard. Others you will find say you have to have reasonable access to the made care coordination service without delay, or timely access to a non-objecting physician or resource timely access to a resource only that will provide accurate information about a medical treatment or procedure, 
Uh, the worst, in my opinion, is an information package. Here you go, uh, which includes a phone number. Um, so the path ahead on this one, well, we've got the decision to come from the Ontario Court of Appeal. Maybe it will go up to the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, I think also that we can see the development of strategies for um, reducing involvement while ensuring access. Uh, so you have a system, you've got your computer in front of you, you're the family doc, you object, the person asks for it, you hit a certain code and it goes, it's an automatic, it goes over to a colleague who's down the hall and they pick it up. And that's a very, very minimal engagement in, in a process. Um, we should, we will also see, I hope, more robust self-referral programs so that individuals who at least know about it can call and say, I don't want to talk to my doctor about it or my doctor is not willing to talk to me or objects or whatever. They can call and they can just get into the system that way. Um, also, the flip of it is that maybe we'll see the enforcement of some college standards. So when the college says you have a duty of effective referral and we find out that people are not doing it, that the college would actually stand up for the standard and enforce it. We have not seen that with abortion, which is the, a related issue around conscientious objection. So I don't know whether colleges will do this, but that is an option. So again, watch this space. Okay, moving from providers to institutions. Specifically here, I'm talking about publicly funded, faith-based institutions. Okay, we've seen a number of cases, you'll have seen them in the news, um, in which institutions have refused to allow assessments or the provision of MAID um, within their walls. Um, St. Paul's Hospital was an example uh, where a man was trans, had to be transferred out. He had to reduce his pain meds in order to be competent at the time over at the other hospital. There was a delay in having the ambulance to transfer him. He was in agony for hours. Eventually got transferred. The Alberta cases you've heard about, one of them, the, the, the barriers were just such that the person never actually was able to access MAID. The other two, they were, they were forced out, one of them having an assessment uh, effectively in a bus shelter across the street from the hospital. So it's not going well for the Deputy Minister of Health in Alberta right now. Um, Newfoundland Labrador took a different approach. And they've actually said um, patients and residents must be able to request MAID you have a duty to refer as a provider, and interestingly, faith-based facility must provide a private space for the provision of MAID on site if transport will, in the view of the MAID team, not the faith-based institution, cause the patient or the resident undue suffering. They actually have, apart from Quebec, the, I think the most protective of patients access position. It's very difficult to find that statement. Um, it's not online anywhere, um, but that is the policy. Quebec in its legislation, hardcore institutions have to provide. They have an exception for palliative care hospices, but not uh, faith-based institutions. Nova Scotia, at the moment, we are without a policy, and I will come back to that. Um, so at the moment, effectively, um, St. Martha's Hospital, which is a faith-based hospital, it's the only one in Nova Scotia, is allowed to refuse to allow assessments and to allow the provision of MAID. It is the only hospital in Antigonish. So what lies ahead? Policy reform? Policy reform where you say, for instance, you allow forced transfers except where the transfer causes suffering or risk of loss of capacity. That's certainly what I've been advocating here. Or you make an analogy to the birth of a Dutch princess. I love this. Princess Margaret in Ottawa in 1943. They had to declare a room in the hospital there, extraterritorial, like not part of Canada, because she couldn't be born outside could be born in a foreign country. Uh, so they, did, but she was being born here because of the war. So they, they said, this room is not Canada. Um, <laughs> and so I figure if they could do that for that, couldn't we have a statement like this? Any room in any St. Martha's building within which a patient wishes to be assessed for or provided made shall for the period of the assessment and the provision and to the extent of actual use for such purpose. And I took all the language from the, the Dutch proclamation, because it was a government proclamation, should be outside the scope of the mission assurance agreement they have with St. Martha's and under the authority and be the responsibility of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. We could do that. Or we will have more terrible cases. We'll have our own bus shelter cases in Nova Scotia, and they will happen across the country. And we'll end up in court. If this doesn't get fixed, we're going to court. 
because this is a charter right. It's really lucky that if you type into Google Images, watch this space, you have an endless supply of these. So I just will keep going with my little watch this space. It's sad that so many of the issues actually end with watch this space, though. But that's where we are. OK, the outstanding federal issues. OK, you'll be familiar with some of these, and certainly advanced requests. And I suspect a number of you who are here today, that's why you came, was the last bullet on this slide. Requests made in advance of loss of capacity. So under the legislation, interestingly, and this is unusual, they mandated a review of some issues. So they said that the Minister of Justice and Health had to get independent reviews done on three issues. Mature minors, so individuals under the age of 18 who understand the nature and the consequences of the decision, because 18 is excluded. Um, advanced requests, so requests that are made in advance of loss of capacity and made for people who, whose sole underlying medical condition is a mental illness. And they had to report back to Parliament. So they commissioned the Canadian Council of Academies to appoint an expert panel, which they did. And that panel had to answer the following question. What is the available evidence on, and how does it inform our understanding of, made in the case of the three issues? given the clinical, legal, cultural, ethical, and historical context in Canada. An exhaustive assessment of the evidence was done. I can tell you it was exhaustive. First-hand experience, I was on that panel. Almost killed me. Um, no recommendations were made, and that is because that was not in the mandate. That was explicitly not in the mandate of the expert panel. We weren't allowed to make recommendations. So it was an assessment of the evidence, and those reports were delivered into Parliament December 2018, available online. Uh, just Google into the Canadian Council of Academies, and they're there. Meanwhile, Nova Scotia's own Audrey Parker. I'm sure some of you in the room knew her. I didn't have the good fortune to know her. I just know of her. So she entered the scene, and in her own inimitable way, uh, she made her mark on this issue. Audrey had terminal cancer, and she wanted MAID at some point. She met the eligibility criteria, but she wanted to try to have one last holiday season. So this was this fall. But because of her cancer, the type of cancer she had, she couldn't be confident that she wouldn't lose capacity and then lose her eligibility for MAID. So she elected to have MAID earlier than she wanted to in order to avoid losing the chance of having made. In her own words, I think we hear the case for changing the law. She said, I think once I've signed the papers and have agreed, it should stand. But I still have to worry that if I lose my marbles, that they won't do it. And then I'm going to die poorly. She said, I wanted to make it to Christmas and New Year's Eve, my favorite time of the year. But I lost that opportunity because of a poorly thought out federal law. I just can't gamble with my end of life and the pain I endure. There, we'll come back to this. But there are some other troubling scenarios in relation to advance request. And I'm just focusing on advance request of the three. I can come back to the others, but limited time. So I'm focusing on this one. The other troubling scenarios are this. Uh, when self-administration doesn't work, you've got that problem that I pointed out. You're not capable anymore. So the government's arguing your consent's not valid to an injection. What happens if you have an unexpected loss of capacity while you're waiting? If it's expected, you can cut out the 10-day waiting period. But if it's unexpected, you're inside that 10-day waiting period, and then you're just out of luck. Or the provider is scheduled to come on Monday, and you think you're fine, but you don't make it. You then lose the capacity to have, you lose the opportunity to have made. And provider unavailability, unavailability delays are also an issue in relation to this. And we had a case. Stephanie Green, who's the head of the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers, tweeted about this last week, um, where she had she was trying to get to someone. The scheduling is impossible. There was a delay, and um, lost capacity. So loses the loses the opportunity for me. So where to from here on this? Well, we could amend C14, amend the legislation, and say that. Everybody 
is eligible if they give consent in advance after they've been assessed and found to have met all the eligibility criteria. That's the assessed and approved, which is coming to be known as Audrey's Amendment. You could also have a rule that says any time after one is diagnosed with a condition that is reasonably likely to cause loss of competence or after a diagnosis of grievous or irremediable condition, but before the suffering becomes intolerable, you can make an advance request and then if you lose it, you can have it. And that was the recommendation from the Special Joint Committee of the House and the Senate before the legislation was introduced. Or you could say after having been diagnosed with a grievous and irremediable medical condition, understood in the Carter way, but not yet experiencing intolerable suffering. And that was the recommendation of the Provincial Territorial Expert Advisory Group that reported out in the December before the legislation came out in the spring. The other possible path is litigation. And if we don't see amendments to C-14, we are going to see litigation. Um, in the fall, then Minister of Justice and the Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould, who had um, championed C-14, in response to inquiries triggered by Audrey's case, said the following, we're not considering changing something in the legislation. She said, we're confident in the legislation we've brought forward, that it finds the right balance in terms of being able to access medical assistance in dying, protecting the autonomy of individuals to make the appropriate decisions for themselves, as well as protecting vulnerable individuals. Now, this quote was a bit of a kick in the teeth to those of us on the expert panel who had just spent an extraordinary amount of time and energy doing the assessment of evidence to be told she's already made up her mind. But that's what came out. But then, was it just last week? There was a cabinet shuffle. And Minister of Justice, Attorney General David Lametti, took a slightly different tack. So he has said, I'm interested in watching what happens and what is proposed, but I won't commit the government to doing anything more than that. So it's not great, but it's better than what we had before. We're watching the court cases. We're watching what other people say. We're watching the impact on the ground, as I think any good government does. But in particular for this piece of legislation, because that's what we promised we would do when we passed it, he said. We saw it very much as a process. It's hard to say what will happen, uh, especially here, uh, given the election timing. And that cuts both ways, and people may want to talk about that. You will have much more insight into that than I do. Finally, the outstanding issues in Nova Scotia. The fact that we have no MAID program, we have no MAID policy, and the only official word is on the website, and it includes incorrect information. So let me tell you about a few of these things. So on the absence of a MAID policy, the Nova Scotia Health Authority website says, the Nova Scotia Health Authority does have a draft policy. However, because the legislation reached royal assent only recently, I pulled this off. I checked it's still there yesterday. The processes outlined in this document, specifically contact by calling, will apply until this policy, including consultation with stakeholders, is complete. Two and a half years is recent? The legislation passed only recently? And what consultation? My invitation got lost in the mail. Uh, the invitation for the MAID providers in Nova Scotia got lost in the mail. Well, I don't know what consultation. We're at 950 days since the passage of the legislation, and we do not have a policy in Nova Scotia. I think that's scandalous. On the mistakes point, on the website, which as I said, it's the only official source of information from the NSHA, you will find, for instance, the following. The federal government is committed to further study as it relates to these exclusions. However, at this time, the following are excluded. Requests by mature minors, advanced requests, and where mental illness is a sole underlying medical condition. That is false. It's not true that people with mental illness as a sole underlying medical condition are excluded under the legislation. I have a letter from the Minister of Justice and Jody Wilson-Raybould saying that. The NSHA has been given that letter. That is still on the website. It's not true. Also, they say, we are waiting for clarity in relation to reporting requirements and we'll provide information as we receive it. The federal reporting requirements have been enforced since November 1st, 2018. And if you don't meet them, you, you run the risk of a penalty of up to two years imprisonment. 
It's not right to have that kind of false information when you have no policy, you have nothing else to give guidance to people. So honestly, the path ahead on that one, I, I don't know. I'm really flummoxed. Don't get to use that word a lot, but it fits here. <laughs> it's like, there's no excuse, and I don't understand. I can't figure out how to move the NSHA on this. I've tried everything that I can think of. So maybe in the discussion period, too, somebody will have a good idea. I hope so. At any rate, in sum, I would say that there's a really long road stretching out behind us. We look in our rearview mirror. We see the path we've traveled to get to where we are today. But if we turn to look out the front windshield, uh, there's a long path ahead. There's a lot we still have to do. But I would say that if we keep in mind those people who've been helped by having made illegal in Canada, they've either accessed it, accessed it themselves or they've taken comfort from knowing that it would be available to them if it got to the point where they felt they wanted it. Then I think we've got the fuel for the journey. And now it's your turn. Open the floor for comments and questions and discussion and anything you want to say. Yeah. In the last two weeks, I uh, gathered some hearings regarding changing the law of the issues talk about. And uh, a group representing challenged and disabled people in Canada likened any changes to Nazi Germany. Yeah. How chilling an effect do you think that will have from the possibility of changes? I don't I don't think it will because you know that's actually a really old argument that's been made throughout the entire time of trying to um, have made become available in Canada was made against the changes. It'll be made against any change. I think it's lost some of its force. I think people recognize it as a, it's an inflammatory rhetorical move, in my opinion, because I do not think that you can reasonably characterize anybody who is engaged in this debate and wanting to have the law come out a certain way as being Nazis or like Nazis. I think it's completely un unhelpful. Um, analogy to draw. I think you can object. I think the public policy debate about advanced requests, about mature minors, about things, I think we have to have a really robust public conversation about it, and we will disagree about it. But we need to base that on evidence, solid arguments, not name calling, not inflammatory rhetoric, but let's have a really solid, robust public consultation on this. And if we want a model for that, look to Quebec. Because Quebec went through a process of public consultation because it got to legislation before we did. And honestly, it was an amazing process. It was so nonpartisan, and it was very much about let's figure out the questions we need to ask, let's find the evidence we need, let's work our way through the arguments, let's talk to everybody, let's hear people's concerns, let's design the legislation, let's move forward together. And they did it. And as a result, they have a much, they have a piece of legislation that has much more buy-in from the community. And I hope we do that for, um, for the three issues that are the federal ones that are outstanding. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask about uh, with regards to the mental illness. Yes. Has that changed recently? Because I did um, attend also a public lecture. It was done under the Mid-Med School, and it was led by mm -hmm. the physician, and he did make that statement. But that is, if it's only, if you only have are yeah. access to. And that's wrong. Nothing has changed. The legislation is the same. What's going on is that you, in effect, many people who have mental illness as a sole underlying medical condition are excluded because they don't meet the eligibility criteria of natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. But they are not excluded. There is nothing in the legislation that says if you have a mental illness as your sole underlying medical condition, you can't qualify. Mental illness doesn't qualify. There is nothing there that says that. And, and that's why I wrote to the minister, because people were saying this. And I'm like, where is that? There? Because what people were doing was they were reading into the three issues being up for review. They thought that meant they were excluded. 
but it doesn't. What it means is, I mean, two of them are excluded, but not by virtue of the call for a review. They're excluded because there's a rule that says you have to be 18, and there's a rule that says you have to have immediate reconfirmation of consent right before provision. Um, but people read them as if that's what it meant, that they were excluded, but they aren't. Give you an example where, because you can think, well, how would you ever qualify? There's at least a couple. One is, for instance, you could be um, in an advanced state of irremediable anorexia. So incurable, advanced state of declining capability, enduring an intolerable suffering that's irremediable by any means acceptable to you, and your natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. So you could qualify, and you could be capable. Right? And you could be 18, and so it could be there. The other is because of the weird thing that the minister said about being 89 years old, so Kate Carter qualifies. Arguably, you could have a mental illness as your soul and blind condition. If you're old enough, you'll, you'll meet naturally foreseeable, reasonably foreseeable because of your age, which is, I wouldn't want to rely on that because I think she, I think they, I think they thought Kate Carter was terminally ill. Truthfully, I don't think they realized she wouldn't qualify. With the, with the way they wrote the legislation, so so uh, the letter is um, the letter is available uh, if people want to see it. That where the minister says no, not excluded. And in fact, it's actually in the, the CCA panel reports um, are clear about that too. That what this is studying the mental illness report is more about thinking through what does it mean to have someone with a sole underlying medical, men, medical condition, which is a mental illness, access made? What are the complexities of that? What do we need to be concerned about and so on? And in part, that's a bit of an anticipatory question because if the charter challenges are successful, reasonably foreseeable, we'd be gone, and then, then the, the doors are wide open on mental illness as a sole underlying condition, right? What keeps most people with mental illness as sole condition out of eligibility for made is the reasonably foreseeable criteria. So if that gets struck over there, we then have a lot of questions about how are we going to deal with this? Because to not allow it is discrimination. It's discrimination on the basis of mental disorder. So how are we going to do it? And so it's looking at capacity and prognosis and how do you tell whether treatment's, you know, a condition is incurable and all kinds of things like that. So, you know, when somebody next stands up and says that, or on the website, you just say, um, where, are you, where do you find that in the legislation? It's not there. And the minister has said it's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a uh, regulated health professional, and I have been involved in, 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 in patients uh, requested to qualify to be humane. And I guess one of the things that I feel really challenged by is, is we can, I today could complete a personal directive. And yep. in that personal directive, I can say, you know, if I'm extremely ill and there is no uh, chance of me regaining my my prior cognitive uh, status, I, I don't want to be resuscitated, I don't want to be fed, I don't want uh, life support. And I don't have to still be in my right mind when the time comes <coughs> to, to say yes, that's what I want. And I guess it's, you know, it's definitely their way. And I just, I really, really struggle with that. Well, what you've articulated is one of the principal arguments for allowing made through advanced requests. Absolutely. One of them is to say, what is the difference? The end result is the same. Both are about exercising your autonomy, ending suffering. Protections are there. Uh, why would we allow one and, and not the other? I think that's a very strong argument. I, I support advanced requests. Um, and one thing that happened when, when we got the legislation we got, when we got the Carter decision, was that the argument was made, well, wait a minute, you're allowed to, not, not in the advanced directives context, but in the you're capable context, you can refuse anything. I can refuse blood, or I know all I need is blood and I'm going to live. I can refuse antibiotics. I got a pneumonia. You know, nothing's guaranteed, but imagine, like, it's a really easy pneumonia for some, somehow. It's, I got an easy bug. I got a really good bug, and we got the drugs, and I can kill. I can refuse it, and I'm going to die. I can refuse food and water. I can refuse artificial hydration nutrition. I'm capable. I can do all that. Why can't I ask for and get made? And that argument was persuasive in the court. 
one of the things that the, the reasoning that um, Lynn Smith offered us is to say there isn't a morally sustainable distinction between those two things. And so if we're going to allow it here, we need to allow this. And we need to recognize that it will happen in the same context of extraordinary protection. And in fact, MAID, I would say you get much more protection around MAID than you do around refusals of treatment. And similarly, if we get advanced requests for MAID, you'll get much more protection around it because it'll be a federal system and it'll be really tight than you will around advanced directives or Nova Scotia personal directives because that's actually not the best regulated system that we have. But so your, your discomfort is, I would reframe as an argument, and a, a, a significant pillar in the, in, the, in the suite of pillars that sustain an argument for advanced requests. Yeah. Where does the opposition for me come from? Like, is it simply religious ideology, or is it more complex than that? It's, it's more complex. Um, religion is certainly a part of it. And certainly more so in the context of, for instance, that, whoa. Oh, that's a light. That's not a power outage because this stuff's still on. Somebody just leaned there on either side. If somebody can just help us out by bringing them. Whoa. OK. We don't need the screen. That's OK. We got lights. OK. That was, yeah, exactly. And the scene. OK. So sometimes it's religious. So I was talking to St. Martha's. So the, the objection to allowing it within St. Martha's is religious. A lot of the objection to assisted dying is religious because it is contrary to many religious denominations, for sure. Not all. And a lot of people who identify as, for instance, Catholic and so on actually support assisted dying. I was shocked by the strength of the support in some of the um, polling that was done prior to, prior to the legislation. Uh, but it's not all there is. So you, you also have some people who object um, because they have a conception of palliative care that they believe doesn't include hastening death, and so they want no part of it. I actually think we're witnessing a bit of a, um, a battle for the soul of palliative care almost. Like there's a real shift in generations around palliative care, and I think in a number of years we're going to see palliative care actually doesn't hold on to that view. It holds on to the view that some people will participate and some won't, but not that palliative care by definition somehow excludes MAID. Um, you also have real concerns about some of the, um, <coughs> the advance request and the getting rid of reasonably foreseeable from some people with disabilities and some groups that represent some people with disabilities. And I say that advisedly with the sum and the sum because what often gets presented and more so in the past got presented is as if persons with disabilities were all opposed to MAID. And that's simply not true. And so, yes, there is a strong community uh, of persons with disabilities and their advocates who are opposed, but there is also a really strong community of persons with disabilities who support MAID. And, you know, all three of the plaintiffs would be described as persons with disabilities. Joe Arve, who successfully argued the Carter case, is a man in a wheelchair. You know, there's there's a lot of people who think Chantelle Petitclair, Google Chantelle, she's a senator, a former Olympian, and she gave her maiden speech in the in the in the Senate on C14 and talks precisely about what it is to be a person with a disability. And she's talking against the reasonably foreseeable requirement. Because she's basically saying it's paternalistic and patronizing. So on the one hand, there's a sense that it's paternalistic, patronizing, and it's discriminatory. On the other is a fear. And, and you know we have to confront this as a society. And this is what I mean about having a conversation that's full and robust and respectful of what's being put on the table and, and what we can do about it. It's the, the fear that persons with disabilities have not been well served in our society. There are, it, the, the services, the health services, the community service, all those kinds of services are struggling for that. And so fear that if you introduce this, will those services disappear? Will there be pressure on people to access made? Will their lives just be worse than they could otherwise be because we have this? The evidence doesn't support that, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not important to talk about it and to hear and to work through and see what the, see what the suggestions are. So, and then the final argument is slippery slopes. Which is, if you allow this, then you then this we accept 
but we don't accept these, then if you allow this, we're going to end up over here. And the evidence on that is strongly against that. That We've got decades of experience in Europe and the, and the States now. And that argument really just um, was, was, was rejected in the court and should just stay rejected. The other stuff, and, and I think it's worth, I think we want to do that where we, we, we park the ones that aren't supported by the evidence or they aren't supported by logic or law. And then we focus on the ones that are, that are a real part of people's lived experiences and their fears and their concerns, and then we work together to resolve them. At the same time, we respect people's charter rights. Yeah. Um, I have a question because in terms of the settings that the care that you're talking about for me, in terms of application and visitation, they were largely acute settings. Mm -hmm. But here in Nova Scotia, in terms of long term care yep. for profit, um, in terms of any policy implementation of the program, if that were to come into, um, into effect, can you give any idea of what some of the potential barriers would be or some of the issues in terms of for profit uh, agencies? carrying that over, allowing that to happen on their, their grounds or in their facility. It's a part of the palliative care package. So there, there's lots of different things going on in that question. Um, so no, 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 let's us talk about all kinds of great things. Um, because one issue relates to where's the funding of it. And my best understanding of this, and, and anybody in the room can correct me, is is that it is it flows with the practitioner. So it's not like the it's not going to have a financial implication for a long-term care facility. The, the practitioner provides the service and they, they get paid for providing the service. Whether it's allowed, absolutely allowed. Sorry? Sorry, I'm just saying it wouldn't be considered like part of the Department of Health and Wellness or whatever they would budget for that? Well, it's fee for service okay. and the coverage of the drugs. That's, that's what it is. It's a service, right? You, you have an assessment and then you have a second assessment. You have the provision. Um, you got to go get the drugs from the pharmacy. It's all, it, it, and it, it, whether it can be allowed in an institution, guarantee, absolutely, it can happen anywhere. There is nowhere that um, MAID is not allowed in, I mean, a public space that would traumatize people, that kind of thing, yes, of course, but, but no, you know, no facilitation. Whether a facility would have to allow it, um, it's interesting because what, the difference between some of the, well, it, it, to me, in large part, it depends on if they're getting public money, then yeah. If people don't have a choice as to where to be, then yeah. Um, it's people's home. And so, you know, there was a case out in BC where a fellow was in a, a Jewish retirement home. Um, he was not, he didn't share the beliefs that were opposed to made. It was his home. And he wanted to have it there. And they said no. And then what ended up happening is the doctor went in surreptitiously and gave it to him. They then made a complaint against her. Surprisingly, um, but part of the analysis was why should he have to leave his home in order to to have this? So there's different analyses, right? Like, so in, a, in an acute care setting, you're not going to have the home argument. In a long-term care facility, I would be reflecting on what is it? What is someone's community? A lot of people in in, in a long-term care facility that is their social world, and to say, oh, you have to go somewhere else, we have to think that through before we say something like that. Um, and one quick little thing too. When I said there's no program, MADE is happening in Nova Scotia for sure. I just don't want to leave anybody with a misapprehension. It, it's happening. We just and we have a central number, and there's some coordination and so on. We have a number of providers who've stepped up and are doing this, but it isn't um, a program such as we have in Alberta, and so it doesn't. It's not a proper self-referral program and those kinds of things. So that's what we, that's what we we need a coordinated program that has all the elements and does the wraparound, including things like family support. What do you do when you're the person who gets left behind? All, all kinds of things like that. So I haven't heard problems yet with respect to long-term care facilities of people wanting access and not being able to access. Doesn't mean it's not happening. Are you on this or a follow-up? It's a two-finger one. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, I just um, I have a fair bit of knowledge about the long-term care system. Oh, great. And in Nova Scotia, it does not matter with if you're a profit or not. The rules are all exactly the same. Okay. The other thing is, although it may happen, the uh, interesting enough, one of the recommendations in the paper these last last week uh, is an upgrading of the '70s Nursing Home Act. Uh -huh. But until that changes, nurses in long-term care are not allowed to start IVs. So uh -huh. it would be it would be BON in mm -hmm. most, most mm -hmm. communities. 
coming in, mm -hmm. as well as um, the position that's assigned to the facility, or if he didn't want to, another position to look yeah. to do it. So there's. Um, and that's what's happening a lot, right? It's the physicians. The, the physicians are more, I think you're finding the family physicians will do assessments but not be the providers, and there's a group of providers. So they would go in, they got their bag, they, they, they might not like to do the ID. I don't believe that there, there would ever be uh, accepted if, if a lot of young children were supposed to say, said not happening, we won't do it, or right. you're going to have to leave your home and go to the hospital for that. Yeah. I don't. Okay, and we're kind of the flip in the sense that Newfoundland, my understanding is they actually have no faith-based publicly funded hospitals, but their issue is in their long-term care facilities. And for us, we may be, we may be yeah. over here at the back. Well, not all the way to the back. Yeah. Um, my just, is there any effect on life insurance policy for someone ah. does go through No. Which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, uh, we, I was on the Provincial Territorial Expert Advisory Group, and it's the first time this issue actually got surfaced. And we had the Canadian life insurance people come in. And I was all set to be like, okay, you guys don't get in the way, and what do you have to change? Because you, you know, you have a two-year rule, and, all. and they said, oh, um, we have no problem with respecting life insurance policies as long as the legislation, when it happens, um, is followed. <laughs> what? You even put that in writing? Sure. So, stunningly, that is the case. So, so quick thing: the two-year rule that people hear about. That's basically that if you, it, you, on normal circumstances, you purchased your insurance, and then within two years you commit suicide, th your insurance doesn't go. And that's because of an information asymmetry, right? You can't just go do that. Um, but that's actually not the case in all kinds of life insurance, because that's individual. Group, it's actually not a provision in, in, in most, if not all, life insurance, group life insurance, which I, I did not know either. So, that's that. But they also have very clearly said life insurance made not a problem. You follow the legislation, you're fine. Yeah. Um, I just want to say there's a few of us here that are Audrey's friends, and we're here obviously because um, it matters and she's a so vocal about what she did. But, um, I just wanted to say that she was so um, devastated actually that she had to pick that date before she had to. Yeah. And, um, but I just wanted to tell you that, you know, her, the, the powerlessness that she felt. And even though she, a lot of the requirements that you said were that was old enough, she had. You know, yeah. She knew she was so she, 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 she was still actually together. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was very, very difficult for her. But look what she did. I and mean, you have to know Audrey to know that only Audrey could do what she did, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a Yeah, and you know, when you run out of steam, when you're fighting this fight, then you just think, okay, what did Audrey go through? Oh, okay, get yourself back out there, right? So, did you want to follow on? Well, yeah, I'm also a friend of Audrey's, but just on that note, um, I never actually heard of it until probably Audrey. But I just want to know why a country like Switzerland is so far ahead of uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Switzerland in particular is, is kind of funny. It's, it's, it's I'd say, almost inadvertent. Um, their criminal law was for, it's an old criminal law that this affects. They don't have made legislation. It's just that their criminal law required that you have a certain kind of a motive for assisted suicide to be illegal. And that's not what's going on here, therefore it's not illegal. So they didn't have to change anything to make it be legal. Um, other jurisdictions very much did. Um, and then you could ask the question of why are they so far ahead? And I think you look at the, you know, the, the political, the analysis of the, um, the culture in the Netherlands in many ways explains it, what I've read about it. A different culture explains what's going on in Oregon and Washington and the other American states, the absolute, like, individualist and and it, it, that's, what, that's what has propelled the American model. The Dutch model is much more a liberty model. And 
why would you allow suffering to continue when that's what this person wants and, and so on. So that's how that went. The Belgians then influenced by the Netherlands, Luxembourg then influenced by Belgium, and so you get that you get that swing of the of the countries. Um, but Switzerland's just this sort of, <coughs> of almost a fluke. So that's why you it, you wouldn't explain. There's not a cultural thing that explains the difference. It's just actually how they wrote their their original criminal law. That's my understanding. Yeah. This 180-day review that you mentioned for the advanced class under Bill 14, do you guys submitted a report? Yep. What is the obligation now? There's no obligation for them to do anything with it um, in the legislation. I would say there's a moral obligation on them to have a robust public policy discussion about what the law should be on these issues. I think they have that. Um, you know, they hit pause. They said, we're not taking a position on these issues in effect because we need more time and these are the ones we want to study. So when you do that, I think then you have an obligation to go back. And I think you also have an obligation to people who wrote those reports. Um, the idea was this is to be evidence that then fuels a public discussion and then the policymakers will take decisions. Um, and I think if we weren't right where we are on the timing of the election, you might even then have seen um, an announcement of, I mean, not not actually with the former minister, because she was very certain that they got it right, so I don't even have confidence she would have put a committee together. But with this one, I would think, say we had two more years till the election, it wouldn't surprise me at all if this minister announced a committee, a parliamentary committee, because that would be your next step. You got this great assessment of evidence, now, now let's have the consultation, let's go across the country, let's talk to Canadians, let's find out not what's the evidence, but what do, what, what's the social, what are the moral views of Canadians on these issues, what should we do, and then either come back to Canadians and say, we have now made a decision, we're not changing the law at all, or these are the amendments that we want to make to the legislation, we want to propose to the legislation. So there isn't an obligation. There's an obligation for a five-year review uh, of the whole, of how is the legislation going, one of the things that I've heard little rumblings of is this notion of, oh, but this, this, the CCA, because I'm saying, well, why you got to do something with this report? Well, it feeds into the five-year review. And my response to that is, no, two-year-old evidence that's stale. You don't, you don't do your evidence assessment two years before you do your review. So it clearly can't be that, and clearly Parliament didn't intend for it to be that, because they otherwise they would have said, have your reviews in four years after four years, and then you do your review in five. You know, that makes sense. So it's public pressure on them. But there is this five-year provision, too? I'm just five-year provision, not of the three issues. It's the whole thing. Yeah, five years, they, they have to review the whole thing. But, there, you know, this election thing is going to be interesting because it cuts both ways. Right? This is an issue that a lot of people, um, they're opposed to, and they're and then it's an issue a lot of people want advance requests. And that's what I'm most curious to see, whether that one. The others, I don't think will become election issues at all. But the advance request one might, because so many Canadians want it. Um, and, and see it as you know the argument of, wait, I can, I can have a personal directive, I can do that. So I don't know if that one's not going to be an election issue. And so I, I, I'm confident that they are frantically trying to figure out what to do about this. Um, but I don't know what they're going to decide. Well, it's also difficult to see how you could have a court case of those advanced directives as well, right? If you look at all the other cases where you've had an individual who's critically ill and suffering, it's kind of a prototype for the case. But if you're talking about advanced requests, and somebody says, oh, I definitely want this, but by the time the case rolls around, they don't remember that they wanted it. Oh, how do we litigate that? Yeah, but we can we can do that. We we if we'd known Audrey, if we'd met her a little earlier. I think we could have had we could have pulled together litigation on that. There've been other cases where like there's a plaintiff and you're thinking okay, um, but it hasn't worked. But it will, it will. And and they are separate cases. Yeah, nobody don't don't think the charter challenges that are happening now are not at all about events requests. So the issue of the litigation on it will be a separate case. And you have those issues, but, you know, Gloria, Kate Carter was dead before the case even started, um, and Gloria Taylor died 
during the process of it because it, of an unexpected, actually an unexpected infection. So as long as you can get far enough and you have an entity like the DC Civil Liberties Association um, behind it as a public interest standing plaintiff, you can carry the case the rest of the way. So it'll be, it, it's tricky, but it's, it's totally doable and it will happen if the legislation doesn't change. So I'm trying to share something to write spiritual care, and I did the whole thing made me change. And uh, my experience and the evidence seems to indicate existential distress is the main motivator for the request for me, for more than for physical suffering. And yet these are, uh, I've not been really part of the dominant conversation, which is the legal and, and medical ethics. I'm wondering, what is the extent of uh, conversation around existential distress from the spiritual community, hopefully beyond some doctrinal declaration, uh, because that's what's stirring in the heart of the people who are asking for me. And when it's addressed well, they die peacefully and carry less baggage. And most of the time it's not addressed. And so they have alleviate physical suffering, but they carry their existential pain. Right. Right. So I don't know if it's a matter of terminology, but the data um, from Europe and, and the states wouldn't support that existential distress is the main cause of requests. But maybe if, you know, if you're meaning something like loss of dignity, because that's what shows up. I don't, and if you are, then then you're that's that's in that in that realm. Autonomy, loss of dignity, the, and and the other the, is the loss of the ability to do the things that give life meaning. Um, it's not the leading ones are not pain. They're not burden on family. They're it's quite interesting, and the data is really strong on this. Um, so what I think that suggests to us is we need to attend to uh, what people are, why people are asking for this. I mean, somebody brings it up, you'll go like, oh, yes, yes, let me call the person, and they'll be right there, right? Of course not. There are these incredibly robust conversations, and I, I've seen you speak before, and you know, I know that if you were in a room with somebody, trust me, it would be a beautiful conversation. Very respectful, very robust, very deep. Um, not everybody's like that, but, but it, it, that is very much the case. So we need to have those kinds of conversations. We have to ask, why are you, why, why are you asking me about me? What is it that is making you want to say, look, my life is, I, I don't, this is, suffering is intolerable, my condition is intolerable, I want it to end. What is it? Is there anything we can do? That's in the legislation. We have to talk about the alternatives, including palliative care, but palliative care can't fix everything, especially when you're talking existential distress, right? Lots of dignity, lots of ability to do things that you want to do. Can't, can't necessarily, can, but sometimes it can, especially around dignity, but but we have to have that conversation and figure out, is there anything else we can do? And if we can, then we offer. But if the person doesn't want it, well, we say, OK, then we're going to provide. So I think there's a lot of, there's, there is a lot of conversation about the loss of dignity, the loss of the ability to do things that, that um, bring your life meaning, because those are the major precipitators of requests for me. But I don't see it as in the language of existential distress. I would have said that was lower because I wouldn't have made the connection to loss of dignity. Yeah? Um, besides religion, what are the factors that make people resistant to like, palliative care? Like, what are, why, are there, why is part of our population saying no, we don't want this legislation, and we don't want to change? Saying they don't want to allow MAID? Yeah, so it's like obviously there's religious opposition, but why yeah. do But why? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it's, it's religious opposition. It's a concept of palliative care that they think is not consistent with made. It's arguments about slippery slopes, which are not supported by the evidence. Um, it's concerns about the impact on people with disabilities um, and the messaging it says about people with disabilities. Um, in the context of advanced requests, a different set of arguments are made where people are raising concerns about, for instance, um, is it the same person? You know, when before you lose capacity, after you lose capacity, is it the same person? Or how do you know they didn't change their mind? Um, 
those are common arguments. I don't think they're persuasive at all, in no small part because that's exactly what you could ask of a personal directive. And if I say I don't want food and water, if I'm in a persistent vegetative state, you don't get to say, oh, well, maybe she's a different person or maybe she changed her mind. You, know, you don't get to. You have to stop giving me um, food and water. Um, but those are the kinds of arguments that are made in particular about why not to do advanced requests. Another one is um, the impact on healthcare providers. And this is another example of the notion of what, how do we have these robust conversations and, and hear what people, I try and get at what are people concerned about. Because one of the issues is what it's like to be a healthcare provider caring for someone who is going to have made through an advanced request. Also, I would say we have to talk to them about what it's like to be a healthcare provider for somebody who's dying is through VSED. Dying, you know, not giving food and water is so built into the fabric of being a nurse, I think. Right? The caregiving side of it, being a friend, a loved one with somebody to not feed. You know, it's it's this sort of primal. So we gotta talk about that. We gotta figure it out. Because one of the things that's important to say is that while I believe I have a right to medical assistance in dying, um, there are limits on that right that are legitimate. For example, if, if by doing so, I'm causing harm to someone else. And it may be that it's a limit on whether I get it at all, or maybe a limit on how I get it. So that's why I'm willing to say, for instance, that some providers can be, you, you, do, you do not have to participate. Because my right to have it doesn't go to saying, you as a provider have to be the one to do it. That, that, is, a, that is a harm. But it doesn't go so far as to say, you get to say nobody around you will give it, will give it to me. Uh, I just spoke a lot about the provinces and the situation of pay in the provinces. So would you be able to speak further on the case of territories <coughs> and maybe the legislation and the practice itself, if there's any Right, so Nova Scotia, uh, Nova Scotia, Quebec is the province that has its own made legislation that brought made in before the federal legislation. They did it under their health power. Um, it was a, I think, a brilliant move. Um, I think it was an end run around the federal jurisdiction over the criminal law because it's it was prohibited under the criminal law and the feds have power over criminal law and, and the province of Quebec said, we're gonna, we have jurisdiction over health, so we're going to call it health and we're going to do it. And basically they were just daring the, I mean, the feds are not going to come after them, right, just because of the political reality of Canada. Um, so they have their legislation. The biggest difference, um, I would say, is their legislation is uh, covers the waterfront of end-of-life care. So it includes palliative sedation, it includes withholding withdrawal, variety of things. It also has an oversight system. They have a commission. They are, they are monitoring the cases and so on. It's a much more robust um, system. It's more limited because they restricted it. An eligibility criteria in Quebec is you have to be at the end of life. So that's actually narrower than C14. And it's surely narrower than Carter. Um, but basically what happened with Quebec is they put it through. They're the first ones out the gate. They're being cautious. They, they, they put it out the gate that way. And then, they, then we have Carter. And so they're sort of saying, oh, OK, well, we should, we'll have to change ours, because obviously it's, it's, it's unconstitutional with that end of life. But then they're sort of, yeah, but there's going to be federal legislation. And OK, let's just, we should just wait. and harmonize, but then the federal legislation was narrower than I think they thought it would be. So they're like, well, do we harmonize? And then 10 days later, there's the Lamb case that gets started anyway, so maybe C-14 is going to be gone anyway. So I think Quebec has just sort of been, uh, you know, waiting, but, but the, they're, they're going to stop waiting. Because the, with the Truchon case being in court and everybody seeing what they're going through, the pressure on the government to harmonize their legislation with Carter, which would be to take out at end of life, um, and in fact to go to advanced directives. They've already had a committee working on advanced requests in Quebec. They may, within the next six months, come out with an amendment to their law that allows advanced requests, which will be in a really interesting collision course with the federal legislation. Right? Um, the territories, they're not different. Um, the federal law applies. Um, they, they don't, as far as I know, have any um, legislation that even sort of takes specifics of it on. So they're rolling out the system. Um, there's, made, there's made providers. It's, it's, it's going on. I don't, I don't know the numbers because they're, they're small. I, just, I think 
think the numbers in Nunavut are the ones that we don't know, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure on that. But it's, it's, it's allowed. Yeah. yeah. Why do you think the Carter case right sort of started to spur on changes to legislation, but Rodriguez was back decades ago? Yeah. Was yeah. it just a progression of the society, or were there different things in the case? That yeah. Well, you know, they actually had the same disease, Sue Rodriguez and Gloria Taylor both had ALS. So the difference between, so 1993, Sue Rodriguez, some people weren't around, hard to believe. Uh, um, Sue Rodriguez challenged the criminal prohibitions. She lost by a five to four margin, the closest of five to four margin. So it could have gone either way in 93. Um, but then you fast forward to 2011 and you have the case. The biggest things that changed in my mind, let's see, one, the facts in the world available to argue were different. We had, what, 10, 20 years of data from Oregon and the Netherlands and Washington, and we were able to show there's not a slippery slope. So Rodriguez was concerned about slippery slope. Carter is, there isn't a slippery slope. Um, the other change was, so the facts on the ground changed, and then there was legal change. So there were new principles. So Section 7 is the right to life, liberty, and security of the person not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So, right, so if you deprive people of those rights in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice, you don't breach that, that section. So what happened in Rodriguez is they're like, oh, yeah, you know, there's a breach of the right, but it's in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice, so it's okay. But what happened is over the course of those decades, there was jurisprudence, there were cases that developed what are those principles of fundamental justice? Because right, they're not spelled out in the charter. We just sort of the courts figure out what they are. Uh, and so different principles came along. And so we were able in Carter to argue on overbreath, and we won because we had new jurisprudence, new, new decisions out of the Supreme Court of Canada that gave us new arguments. So it was both of those things. Plus, backdrop, huge social change. Right, the level of support. It was always a majority. Back in Rodriguez, there was a majority of Canadians supported decriminalization. But I would say the, 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 the depth of the support, the strength of the support, the interesting, the support in, in, in communities, you wouldn't have expected it. So the ability to demonstrate support uh, from people who identified as very religious, support from people with disabilities, all of that was also in the ether. You know, you're not arguing that in court, but they don't live in a vacuum. So those would be the things that I would say were the greatest uh, factors in why we had 5-4 and then 9 nothing. And I would also say uh, Lynn Smith's judgment in Carter is brilliant. It's very long, but it is actually really accessible. And she goes through all the evidence really carefully in the legal analysis. Highly recommend it to you. You know, I don't think that hurt when it got to the Supreme Court of Canada, that there was such a powerful trial level decision. Um, just another factor. Yeah, but, and I will be, just so people know, we'll be, we'll be wrapping officially at 8.30. I'll stick around and answer things, but we'll actually tie a bow on it at 8.30. So you I have a question. Yeah. First, I just wanted to share my experience. I'm a provider. Wow. And we're all friends in the room. I just really wanted to tell you. So every assessment I've done, Made every patient has talked about Audrey. So she has had just a profound impact on the culture of the program and individual access to the procedure. And I have, you know, been involved in really peaceful deaths that all started with Audrey. I'm really glad to hear from Audrey. My question was that as a provider, I really perceive that there's a huge generational divide. Like everyone my age who's a doctor is like, no issue. I'm going to do this. Frankly, I feel a little bit worried hearing your presentation because I didn't think about any of this stuff. And I kind of raised my hand and said, yes, this is something I want to do. But I'm wondering your evidence review. Did you see a generational divide among providers or even among some of those special populations that you talked about? Is there a, is there a demographic issue here where just this is something that's more acceptable to young people? I, I absolutely have experienced that. I mean, I've been teaching, for one thing, teaching med students for a while and teaching docs, speaking at the conferences and so on. And it hit home most just a few years ago when somebody in the med school came up to me after a talk and said, 
seriously, I do not get what the problem is. You know, it was like, what, why? Of course we should have made. And of course this is a part of what we, it's a, it's a, as a provider, it's part of my care, the suite of services that I can provide somebody with. And it was just the, the blunt way she said it and, and, and was speaking in many ways for you know, her classmates. It's like, this is just not an issue for us, why are you? Um, so I think you see that. I think you see a, a generational change in palliative care because um, this the early palliative care was a lot of people who were very religious. Right? It, that's what pulled you to palliative care. And you also had uh, an experience of that, gener that first generation of nobody wanted palliative care to come to the door because it was like you were the angel of death. Like, I started in palliative care, and there was this, you know, we don't talk about death, and we don't, you don't want to be sent to palliative care because that means you're, you're done, all that kind of thing. And they lived that kind of fighting to get in the door. So I'm sympathetic to, to somewhat, somewhat sympathetic to their hesitancy to be associated with MAID, you know, we've just, we've just managed to get people thinking palliative care, you know, welcoming palliative care, and also seeing palliative care as enhancing life. Palliative care is not, you know, you live longer when you're on palliative care, right? You know, as do you if you know you have access to MAID, I will add. Um, but, but I think there's a generational thing happening in palliative care. It's a much more technical um, specialty, and, you know, we're, we're seeing that kind of thing. Um, you know, I guess there'd be generational issues around religion that would, would shape things. Although, you know, the surprising rates of support across ages of people who are religious. Um, everybody will say the baby boomers are dying. They're used to having total control. They're, that's what this is about. Um, you know, they're going to make sure they, they control on the way out, too. There's all kinds of social dynamics like that. But they do relate to, they do relate to generations. And, you know, we've grown up with a whole lot more sense of, I, I, it's up to me. I don't want to suffer. And I don't have to suffer. I don't, I don't have to suffer. And, uh, and so why is, this, why is this not available? And then also just the spread of the information. I, I, I had a dear friend who's a palliative care doc, and we would debate every year. I'd be out in Vancouver, and we'd have a big debate about it because she was opposed to me, and I wasn't. And friends would just come and watch because we thought it was funny. <laughs> And, and, and then I got a call from her partner who said, you will never believe it. She changed her mind on me. I was like, what? What happened? And it was the evidence. It was the evidence on the slippery slope. She took a long, hard look at the evidence. And it's like, no, it's not there. And that's what was really driving her. So I've gone a long way from your question. But lots of interesting things to say. So many interesting things to say. Yeah. Oh, last question. Yeah, I mean, that's an argument I've been running because people raise concerns about the relationship with suicide. And like, it, it's kind of like elder abuse, too. It's like, if you, no, because we're going to find the elder abuse, but if somebody's being pressured into it, they're going to be having the assessment, and we're going to say, whoa, this is not okay. Similarly, if, you, if, if you're going to seek MAID, and it's the kind of suicide we would want to prevent, that we're actually going to reach you and talk through alternatives and be able to help. So I think that's there. I think the evidence around suicide is absolutely lacking. The, um, the evidence that I've seen is that if anything, your rates of unassisted suicide go down. They, they, this does not have an impact of uh, diminishing suicide prevention efforts or sending up unassisted suicide, anything like that. Maybe that's partly why, you know, because people are getting caught. It's hard to say why, but we have to do a whole lot better at studying suicide prevention. Um, but the mental disorders, um, report does look into this, and um, there's going to be more being done on that in the next little while, uh, because it, it just isn't supported. The concern about, we have to do this to prevent suicide in moments of weakness, which is in the ledger, which is what the government keeps saying. No evidence to support that at all. Okay, I promised I'd let, I, I'd wrap, so we're at 8.30. Thanks very much for being here.